Yes, thank the Lord for the blood. You know, a thought was running through my mind just a minute ago, and I don't know if you agree with me when I say that compassion, uh, when you have struggled, that struggle makes way for compassion. Hardships make way for compassion. What do you mean by that? Have you ever gone through anything and God used it to humble you? You ever gone through something really difficult, and if before you went through it, you might have been kind of harsh in judgment on somebody else. But when you go through it yourself, that's where we come up with the old saying, you know, walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. It's a whole different story whenever it's you. And uh, I've had a lot of places in my life where that I went through some really difficult places, and it allowed me to have compassion on other people. You know, as a young preacher, I mean, I came out of the gate with a baseball bat and a chainsaw, and I was either going to cut it down or beat it down. I was going, you know, I was going to run wide open. And, and, uh, but as I matured, I began to realize, hey, these are God's people. These are real people going through some real stuff. You know, when I first started preaching, I thought, you know, everything's a demon. And, you know, and, uh, and then I realized you get older and you find out sometimes hormones affect things, and you find out a lot of other stuff that you didn't understand when you were younger. What I'm saying is that adversity will teach you a lot. And if it don't teach you compassion, you need to go back and retake the test, right? You know, I was thinking, I'm getting ready to preach here in just a minute, but I was thinking about a lot of the uh, apostles and prophets and men of God in the Bible. And when you think about many of them, I thought, you know, I've read some of their struggles and how that they really had great adversities at times. And many times they would pronounce a judgment on a land or a people, and they would have to live during the same time and have to deal with the same circumstances as all the people who were facing judgment. And I thought to myself, I wonder, I believe it's true, though, I, I wonder if there were times that God didn't allow these prophets to deal with these difficulties and adversities and stuff so that they had more compassion when they ministered to the people. I believe there's a lot of truth to that, don't you? Amen. I believe there's a lot of truth to that. So tonight, if you have your Bible, if you want to go, go ahead and get it out. We're going to get ready to preach the Word of God. This is our first Friday night service, and uh, this will be a new trend. This will be a, a thing we're going to do on a regular basis. Uh, if you want to get your Bible and get ready and stand. Uh, while you're getting there, we're going to turn in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to begin with verse number 8. And um, we'll get ready to stand. It was nearly a, a year ago, I guess I'd say, that I, I felt God place a burden on my heart to preach from this particular text and um, to bring out many of the same highlights that we're going to talk about tonight. But if there's anything that I've learned about God's Word is that it transcends generations and it transcends seasons and difficulties. What I mean by that is that the same principles of struggle and survival that made stories like this that we're about to read of, of this widow woman so many, how many hundreds and thousands of whatever years ago, these same principles of struggle and adversity and survival are still real today. Have you ever read something in the Bible and you thought, man, I've been through that? You ever read a story and you thought, man, I can feel the pain that person's feeling. I've seen that sort of thing. Maybe I, had, I wasn't bowed together for 18 years or maybe I wasn't like that lady, but I had some of the same things going on. I can only imagine how she felt. Well, I want to preach to you along those lines because I look at these stories and when I look at them, I search for certain elements within the story, things that I believe are principles of struggle that I can apply to my life and how they made it through. If you can't read the Bible like that, you will miss out on incredible potential. What are you saying, Pastor? You will be surprised if you start reading God's Word from a different angle and you say, how do the elements and this story apply to me and my household. You start reading it like that, and it can change your whole, your whole perspective. I want to turn to 1 Kings chapter number 17, verse number 8. We've all had some bad seasons. 
How many of you tonight can say it's been one of those kind of seasons? Anybody been through some rough stuff lately? All the hectic stuff that's been going on in your life, got your blood pressure up, anxiety, you about ready to head to the psychologist, psychiatrist, and see if they got something to help your nerves, huh? The different people got different things. They say, well, man, I'm going through this. I don't know what to do about it. Uh, but let me tell you this. God has the answer and the remedy of what we need. So here's what the Bible said. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste. Can someone say that with me? The barrel of meal shall not waste. Say this, neither shall the cruise of oil fail. And I want you to say this one word out loud, until, until. There's an appointed time, God said, until that day. Until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. You know what that tells me? There's a deadline to what you're going through. There's a time when the season's going to go from winter to spring or from spring to summer, from summer to fall. God has a time. Verse 15, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Uh, this is what I'd like to preach for a while tonight, what I felt like God put on my heart to share with you. It's just one of those seasons. Now, if you want the extended LP remix, we'll make it a little bit longer, and we'll say it's just one of them kind of seasons. That's what I want to preach about tonight. Would you raise your heart and hand to the Lord? Let's pray and ask God to have his way. Lord God of heaven, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together on this beautiful Friday night, the saints of God and the presence of God. We ask you tonight, God, that you will uh, pour out your spirit upon everybody that is here, the people that are also watching over the internet. I'm asking you, God, to speak words of wisdom, of power, soundness of speech, God, that can penetrate those walls that people have built up around themselves and let the Holy Ghost conviction do what it was intended to do. Draw us to you, God. I pray that we'll get deeper, we'll climb higher, that we'll get closer than we've ever been to you. God, help us to survive these difficult places, and we're going to praise you, and everyone can say amen. When I think about difficult places, sometimes I think about marriage, divorces, job changes, being laid off, problems, miscarriages, just different life adversities. If you've ever been through a tragic life adversity, raise your hand. Something you wouldn't wish on nobody else, and it was tough. But how many of you that are here can say, I don't even know how, but somehow God brought me through that. Well, when I think about this particular text, as familiar as most all of us probably are with it, I want to take just a brief glance into the highlights of the text so that you fully grasp what God is trying to say to us tonight. For me to be able to accomplish that, we first need to go back to the very beginning here and understand why it is that this nation 
that has been judged by God has had this pronouncing of judgment upon them. To understand why are they in the shape they're in? Why was it that God chose to do this? Well, the struggle of this season that they are in, it is the, the direct product of the fact that these people are dealing with God's judgments for the fact that they had been a rebellious and a stubborn people. That's exactly why they are in the shape that they're in. Now, we don't understand always as a people why the judgments of God come on our lives. I mean, if you stop and think about it, you just think, well, you know, God's a loving God. Why would he allow us to go through difficult seasons? Especially when you're in a marriage. We'll use that as an example. And you're a faithful wife. You pray all the time. You seek the Lord. You go to church. You support it. You say amen to the preacher. I mean, you're doing everything you can to try to be a good Christian woman. And for some reason, all of a sudden, your whole household seems like that everything is falling apart and every demon in hell has unleashed an attack on your family. You say, why is that? Well, sometimes you have to understand that it is not always about you. Sometimes it is not always a direct byproduct of something you did. How many of you know that if you're on board the ship with Jonah, you're going to suffer a little bit of turbulent wind and some rain, and there's going to be some problems when you're on board the ship with Jonah? What I'm telling you is that sometimes we take it as a slide of God's hand against us and say, God, why me? Why am I going through this? I mean, I try to serve you. I try to love you. Why are all these things happening? And sometimes it is the direct result of the fact that there is somebody we're on board with who is not in a complete obedience to God and God's trying to get their attention. And sometimes we all that are on board go through it together. Have you ever experienced that? And you understand that it wasn't because of you necessarily. It could have been the fact you were on board with somebody that God was trying to get their attention. Well, in this situation, God is trying to get the attention of a nation, a nation that has gone astray. And so God allows there to be judgment upon these people, and he does that by Elijah pronouncing that there's going to be a time of no rain. Well, what you have to understand is that whenever the man of God pronounces this time of, of no rain, this drought on the land, when there is no rain, it affects all sort of things. It affects cattle, livestock. It affects animals, wildlife. It affects all sorts of plant life. Everything that you and I depend on to be able to survive. It's hard for us to depend on the steak and the ribs and the hot dogs and whatever else. I don't know what they were eating, beef bologna back then. I don't know exactly what they were surviving on, but everything that they eat also depends on the rain that comes down. There is no harvest of okra. There's no harvest of corn. There's no harvest of potatoes in the field if there is no rain because they don't grow as a result of the fact that there is no rain. Not only that, that there's a scarce provision. It drives up the supply and the demand just like we see today. Anytime that there's a shortage in supply, all of a sudden, all the prices begin to go up because the value of the thing that is needed most is in high demand. And so if it's easy access, it drives the price down. And can you imagine living in a day like this? It's not just the fact that there is a drought, but it affects so many aspects. You get people that are willing to steal from each other, people that are willing to kill somebody over food. If you remember one portion of the word of God, it got so bad that they were selling doves, dung, and donkey heads as a means of survival. I don't know about you, but I never thought about eating doves a dung. I never thought about eating donkey head. Now, I know folk eat pig brains and, you know, cow tongue and all. Y'all keep on eating all that stuff, and I'm going to keep on eating what I eat. I ain't going to be eating no cow tongue, won't be eating no cat, won't be eating no rattlesnake. If you want that, then you have right at it, and I'll save some for you. Come on, somebody. But these people were in a desperate place, and there's no way for you and I to digest exactly how bad that it was without living in that time frame. All we can do is imagine how bad that it might could have been. 
And so to that I tell you tonight, these people are in a desperate situation. There are cattle, and like I said, wildlife dying left and right. There are people that are dying. And what you have to understand is in dire times like this is the most vulnerable people are the ones that die first. That means that people that are, uh, that are up in their age and they're vulnerable to sickness, uh, people that are already barely getting by, they are usually the first ones that die off in times like that. That's where we get the terminology that the strong survive. It's because those that are weak and anemic, those that are vulnerable, they die off in hard seasons like this. And this is what this nation is dealing with. But what you have to see is that it, it, during the time that all this is being set into motion, that God sends his prophet to a little place, a place called the Brook Cherith. And the Bible shows us that God is going to take care of him at this brook. And so what I want you to see is that daily is that God is sending ravens with bloody meat in the hooks of their claws and they're dropping it out of the sky and the man of God is there living in the same time frame as everybody else but God finds a way somebody say this word with me sustain God he finds a way to keep his man alive in difficult times I wish I had time to preach that out tonight but he finds a way to keep the man of God alive not only that, but God says go dwell by the brook cherub because if God knew anything, the God of all wisdom is that a man needs food for nourishment and a man's got to have water to go into his body. And so by that brook, God said, I got you covered. I'm gonna make sure you got food for your stomach and I'm gonna make sure you got water for your body. And so God provides for the man of God. And we read the story, we understand as you've heard me preach before that over a period of time, we began to watch that brook slowly dry up until the point that there's nothing running in that brook anymore. There's no stream coming down the little river there, the canal that God placed him by. And so the man of God is faced with the fact that he might become the next victim of that day's drought. And so God acts. I want you to understand that if you'll stay where you're at until you get fresh orders from headquarters, uh, there will be an order from God to tell you just what to do if you remain faithful to God. You see, the man of God, as I preached before, he could have looked at how small that stream kept getting, uh, and he could have looked around about and said, you know what? I might want to bail out, boys. Things don't look too good. As a pastor, I've watched people do that in church membership. They look around about and say, well, the church is going through a little bit of a dry spell. Might be time to bail ship. But let me tell you, the same God that you had to wait three months for him to tell you where to go to church, you might want to wait another three months to find out if God's telling you to do something different instead of bailing out of the ship before God says to do anything. Come on, say amen. That goes for preachers too. Come on, somebody. It ain't just church members, but that's church folk and pastors too and leadership. But God dealt with this man and let him know it is time for you to get up and I want you to go to Zarephath. I've got something there and God already prepared it. What's strange about it is that God's going to send Elijah to a place of scarce provision. God's going to send him where there's not much there either. But God's got a reason why he does things. Let me tell somebody there are some things you may be seeing in your own life, in your own ministry, and you say, well, I've raised my eyebrows a few times. This seems strange. This don't add up. That's weird. But God says, I want you to understand it may not make sense to you, but it makes sense to me. Just be faithful, and I'll make it all come together when it's all over with. You stand back and say, God, why? But God says, don't ask me why just watch and wait come on now so the man of God he gets up he leaves the place where he has been provided for do you know one of the hardest things in my life 
as a Christian has been those times that I found security in a place, security in a thing. And I say, God, I have got what I needed in this place. God, I have felt what I needed in this place. But there came a time that God said, you got to put your security blanket down, Pastor. you got to let go of the handrail and follow me to the next destination. Do you know that all the way back in 2007, going into 2008, if I would not have obeyed God, I wouldn't have been here for over 15 years. But when God says the brook's dried up and it's time to head to another place, how many of you know you got to obey God? Come on, everybody might not agree with you, but you gotta obey God. But I want you to see what I'm leading up to is not necessarily those details. But I want you to understand the context of the whole story. And so when Elijah gets to the place where this widow woman is, where God plans to sustain him, guess what he finds? He does not walk into a big old pantry full of food. He doesn't walk up to the gates of a Publix and the doors open up and he walks inside with a 80 degree air condition and lined up a stuff on the aisles. Guess what he finds when he gets to Zarephath? He finds a widow woman. You know what the first problem is? Widow woman, she's already lost her husband. She does not have the means to even take care of herself. And you sent me to a place where there's a widow woman who can't even provide for herself? Now that don't make no sense, God. There's somebody right now saying some, some things right now, Pastor, are adding up. That don't make sense to me. Well, you just hang on, listen. I, I believe God will help you if you just listen. You see, he gets there, Brother Coon, and when he walks up to that place in the gate of the city here, he gets up to a point where he sees a wood woman. I, I see her there stirring around in the yard, and she's trying to find sticks. What's she going to do with those sticks, Pastor? She's going to light a fire. What, what, what's she going to do once she lights a fire? Well, guess what? This little widow woman, she lets the man of God know at some point, I don't got very much. Huh? I, I just got a little bit of meal in a barrel. I want you to picture a barrel or some sort of container, a vessel. And in the bottom, it ain't got but just a little bit. And, and, a, and a bottle with oil in it, cooking oil. And it ain't got but a little bit in the bottom. And so when the man of God walks up, he sees the woman in the yard. He calls out to her. He says, hey, would you give me a drink of water? You see, he's the prophet of God. And in their day, I know that today that there's been a lot of misrepresentation of the things of God. But in their day, there was a high regard of respect even in times like this. And that woman hears the voice of the prophet Elijah and he says, hey, would you go get me a drink of water? Here's a woman barely making it herself. She's out in the yard making death plans as she walks. And yet this man wants a drink of water in a time when there's a drought of all things. You know, sometimes it seems like we're barely getting by and you get a phone call and somebody says, you know, Brother Fred, would you pray for me? I'm going through something. Listen, if you're not human enough to admit this, you may be on a level I've never achieved, but have you ever been going through your own mess and somebody wanted your help and you're thinking, are you kidding me? And you try to act all spiritual about it, but you're doing the best you can to pray for yourself. Come on now, y'all nod your head because you know I'm telling you the truth. There have been times before that I, I say, well, I'll pray for you. But I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I probably should ask them to pray for me too because I'm going through my own mess. That's right. But do you know that sometimes that when you're making death plans, God's making provision in the background you don't even know about. So the man of God says, hey, get me a drink. The woman turns, Sister Mel, to go get the man a drink. And as she is going, the man says, hey, wait a minute. While you're at it, would you make me a little something to eat too? The woman turns around almost as if like, man, you got to hear me on out. Listen here. Look, look, here's the deal. Now, you want some drink? I got that. You're the man of God. That's wonderful. But listen, see, I got this little barrel and there's a little bit in it. And I got this little vase, you know, little cruise, and it's just a little bit of oil in the bottom of it. And you know what I was out here doing when you started hollering for me to get you water? I was out here in the yard gathering sticks so me and my son could eat our last meal and die. That's what I was out here doing. And you want me to go get you something to eat? And the man of God looks at her and said, listen, just do as I ask. And here's what God will do. Through your obedience, 
I want you to get that. Sometimes we miss that. Through your obedience of sacrifice, God said, I am going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that the bottom of that barrel never runs dry and the cruise of oil, it never fails. Come on now. So the woman goes and makes him a cake. And guess what? The Bible goes on to say that for many days, somebody say that with me, many days, right in the middle of a time when animals and people are dying left and right, there's a famine, there's a drought, there's, there's problems everywhere you look. But yet this little widow woman who ain't even got a husband, who's got a little son who's dying and they're on the verge of death themselves, they eat for many days until God says that's enough. How do they do that, Pastor Myers? Did God fill that barrel all the way to the top? Did he put so much oil it was flowing over the top of the brim? No, he did not. Guess what God chose to do? It may seem strange, but there's a reason I believe. God put just a little bit more in the bottom of the barrel and in the cruise of oil every day. So here's what I want you to visualize. Every day, every time they went back to that barrel, every time they went back to that cruise of oil, there was a little bit in there. So if I scoop out some meal and put it in a pan and make another cake and I go back tomorrow, there ain't a whole barrel full, but there's enough for one more meal. Somebody say sustain. You and I ought to thank God that even though we weren't going to Texas Roadhouse day in and day out, even though we didn't have the waitress waiting on us and leaving $40 tips, even though we couldn't go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, even though we couldn't go to the beach and eat $80 worth of seafood for one person, that God said you might have been eating Roman noodles or Raymond noodles with a little bit of butter poured over the top, but I got you, and you made it through. You might have had to open up that old can of beans in the back of the cabinet that you wondered if they was expired. But God said, I got you. You might have had to go to the store and combine this with this and this with that to make something for you to eat. Or you might have had to eat food sometimes that you wondered, is it expired? We made this last Sunday, but God said, I got you. I'm going to make sure it might not be an overflow of abundance, but God said, I'll get you through this if you just trust me. How many is thankful that God gets people through tough times? How many of you also agree that tough times make tough saints? Huh? But I want you to see this. Elijah reassures this woman that her obedience is going to make sure or ensure that she'll have what she needs. Listen to what the Bible said. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. In other words, the man of God's letting her know this ain't me. This is God talking. There are, in this generation, there's a lot of misrepresentation of God. A lot of people calling themselves prophets and saying, God said, God said. But how many of you know what it means whenever the, it hits you right? And you know that someone says, God told me to tell you, and you feel it, you receive it. I guarantee you the day the man of God looked that woman in the whites of her eyes and said, the Lord God of Israel has told you this. I believe that woman believed every word because she felt it and she received that word of prophecy. But for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth until you start here raindrops hit the rooftop lady keep dipping huh keep dipping like one preacher said I ain't talking about the skull of the Copenhagen kind neither keep dipping go to that barrel and keep dipping you might reach down in that barrel and think man there ain't barely enough in there for me to get by but God said, keep dipping, honey, because I got you. Somebody say, I receive it, God. I receive that for my family. You see, what I want you to see, that through this promise that God has given, this promise that the Lord gave this woman was not on the amount in the barrel, but on the flow in the barrel. 
I'm going to give you a moment to process that. His promise was not on the amount in the barrel, but on the flow in the barrel. What was God telling her? It's not like you're going to have stockpiles and stockpiles of meal. God said, but I'll tell you what I will do. I will keep a consistent flow. It might be enough for one more cake, but there will always be enough for one more cake. How many can thank God for his consistent flow? I don't know how we made it this far, Pastor. I wondered how that we were going to make ends meet. There were so many months we wondered how we was going to pay the rent. And here we are three years later and still got the rent paid. Come on, somebody. Some of you said, man, I didn't know how we was going to pay that car payment every month. But we still got that car. And every month we bite our nails to the nub on how we going to pay it. But we've been paying it. How? I'll tell you how. Because even though it might not be but just enough for you to make it, God said, I got you. So, ooh, hallelujah. Somebody just go ahead and praise the Lord right here because you failed to do it a long time ago. So what does that mean for this woman and what does that mean for us? Well, so because of the faith that this woman had, this is the result of it. The Bible said, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, she and he and her house and did eat many days and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Again, not Elijah's word. Elijah was just the conduit to bring the message to the woman. I'm telling us here tonight that one of the things that God pointed to me out at more than anything is there's one specific detail of this particular story that I believe that if you read or skim through it, we'll get lost in the overall storyline. What is that, Pastor? Well, let me tell you. We often look at this particular story, and I've done it too, and we preach or we talk about the miracle of provision that kept her son alive. And rarely is there ever much consideration given to the quantity that they survived on. It was a miracle. They made it. That's the grand finale. That's like 4th of July. All the fireworks that go off at once. But can we take a minute for a moment and look at the quantity they survived on? Wasn't much. I want you to know that there's some pillars in our churches. I'm talking about saints that have been on the firing line for many, many years who can testify to what I'm telling you. They are still standing tall today because they served a God that when times were tough, they dug their heels in the mud. They stayed faithful to God. And guess what God did? God kept them. Do you know that one of the greatest testimonies to me You know, there was a time within the church of God, some of y'all that have been around, you'll remember this, even a lot of our Pentecostal churches, where that you would visit a revival, there would be a service, and the pastor would say, has anybody got a testimony? Do you guys still remember the day when everybody had the same testimony? Y'all remember that? I just want to thank the Lord for saving me, sanctifying me, filling me with the Holy Ghost, and y'all pray for me. Huh? Come on now. Y'all heard that testimony a few times too, Right? I just think, and, I, and I'm glad. I appreciate every testimony. But here's what you got to understand. When God takes care of somebody, when God takes care of people, he carries them. It's like God puts them on his back and says, you can't get through this by yourself, but if you lean on me, I will carry you through this during those seasons when everybody was standing up saying, I just want to thank the Lord, save me, Saint, find me, fill with the Holy Ghost, y'all pray for me. Oftentimes, I felt kind of repetitious myself because I always found myself, and I didn't even really know the reason at the time, but now I see. I would stand up and testify that I was so thankful for God's keeping power because I've been through some stuff And I faced some things in life outside of being a Christian. And there were plenty of times that everything fell apart. But when I served the Lord, even in the moments when the flame of my fire was flickering and about to go out, 
I can thank God for his keeping power. How did you hold me up when I felt like my feet were falling out from underneath me? How did you keep me upright, God, whenever it felt like the people around me jerked the rug right out from underneath my feet? I tell you how. It's God's keeping power. And let me tell you something. You might be thinking right now, how can I go on the way things have been? Maybe you're listening online. You've been dealing with some things, and you think, how can I, get, how can I make it through this right here? I'm going to tell you something. God has keeping ability. That while people are dying left and right all around you, God said, hey, I got you. Through your obedience, I'm going to take care of you. Will you lift your hand right now and just say, Lord, if it's me, would you provide and take care? If it's the ones I love, God, would you please tonight take care of them? So we've looked at the miracle. But as we look at the quantity that they survived on, I'm going to show you. Each day, there is a day's ration of provision. Not an entire week. Not a whole month of oil. There's not enough to feed everybody in the whole community. But there's enough for their house. Just enough to survive one more day. You see, this is what the Holy Ghost showed me when I read through this tonight. And I want to share it with you. Maybe you can write it down or either record it on the memory bank of your mind. God did not change the season. He just changed what remained in the vessels. Did you catch that? While some people are saying, God... Get me out of this jail cell. God, get me out of this hospital. God, do change the whole circumstances. God didn't change the season, Brother Matt. Just because they, they, were, do, they were struggling a little bit, God didn't automatically say, okay, it's going to rain now. No, God didn't change the season. He changed the amount and the quantity of what was in the bottom of that barrel each day day what does that mean for me and you that may mean sister and brother that there may be some hard times there might even be some hard times ahead you might you might look around you in a few weeks or a few months and say man i would have never thought i'd lose my husband i'd have never thought that my mama was going to pass or my daddy was going to leave like that I never would have thought that my marriage would fall apart like this. But let me tell you, I serve a God, and I believe you do too, who says, I may not change the season, but I will make sure to change the quantity that allows you to survive in the season. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Hard times might come, but I know a God who can sustain his people. When I read this story, I began to consider the complexity of scarce provision when there's just a little bit. Do you know a little bit torments the mind? I've touched on this recently, it seemed like, but those months... When you're the wife or you're the husband that takes care of the bills and your husband don't seem to get it and he's out buying this and buying that or she's spending money at Ross and checking out at Publix four times a day and, and you're like, babe, I, I love you and all, but you know, uh, there's a whole lot more going out than there is coming in. <laughs> just, just saying, you know. I just want to tell you that you might want to pack a lunch today. <laughs> Uh, and you might not want to put anything else but just bologna and mayonnaise on that bread today. So we got something Friday. See, whenever you're that person and you know the complexity of scarce provision, it torments the mind because you're looking at the circumstance and you fail to look at the God, the God of all creation. When you start looking at how much you owe in that electricity bill, when you start looking at the mortgage payment, 
And you start thinking, well, okay, so I only make $12.83 an hour times 38 hours because they keep cutting my hours back. And so that equals up to, no, that ain't going to work. Let me tell you something. If you live the rest of your life in that frame of mind, you're going to be miserable. Because what the devil will get you doing, he'll get you looking at the problem and stop looking at the promise. I'm not telling you that things don't fall apart. I'm not telling you that hard times don't come. I've been a product of many of those. What I'm telling you is, if you want to survive it, you want to make it through and not become another statistic, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to be obedient to God. And you're going to have to say, Lord, no matter how hard this gets, I'm on, I'm on board for the long haul. No matter how rough this ride gets, if we lose the house, I'm going to still serve you. I'm here to tell you that I have in my lifetime, I'm 50 years old now, almost 51. I've seen people lose things and nearly feel, they felt like they were, they've lost their mind. They've, how do I start all over? I know of a particular pastor that a storm hit their church and completely leveled it. I mean, in his estimation, my ministry's over. The church don't know what to do. Where are we going to have church? And yeah, it was rough for a little while, a season. God says, I'm going to take care of you. So you know what happened? They found a place to have church. It wasn't ideal, but God sustained them. And you know what happened? When it was all over with, that insurance that they pay so much money for every month, came through, God allowed them to get a bigger, better place, and the place that they're in right now would swallow up the church that they was in before. And guess what? It's all paid for. Now you tell me, because what sometimes people don't understand is they're looking at narrowly at their current circumstances, and they can't see a little bit further down the road. But if God gives you a promise and God said, I'm going to take care of you, you can either choose to believe God or you can sit around like this all day. And you know what folks do whenever they start getting like that? They start turning to every other vice and device but God. They stop going to church. They stop having anything to do with God. The worst thing you can do in a drought or a famine is turn your back on God. If you're struggling, you're having problems at home, you and your husband can't get along, don't stop serving the Lord, honey. The best thing you could do, and you better get on your knees and pray for Rotten Ronnie, because if you ever expect him to get saved, you better stay on them bending knees and keep praying, because he ain't getting no better like that. And you just, well, if you can't beat him, join him. Yeah, try that. Next thing you know, he'll be hooked up with Sour Sally. I'm just telling you, folks, if you don't pay no attention to what God's trying to show you tonight, you're going to be on the losing end of the deal. What you need to do is say, God, help me to get my attention focused where it should be because things have been rough. You might be here tonight. You're fixing to go into a season you didn't expect. You better listen to Pastor Myers because I'm trying to tell you, sometimes it's just one of them seasons. But let me tell you, even though it may be a hard season, I know a God who sustains. I, I'm going to have to close because I know it's Friday night and I know y'all want to go eat or y'all want to do something. I don't know what y'all want to do, but let, let me share something with you. I am not preaching something to you that is foreign to me. I remember one time I had a young lady, she told me, she said, well, you wouldn't understand because you're a preacher. Girl, hang on a second. I could tell you some stuff because I ain't always been a preacher. Huh? Those of you that have been along the ride with us or maybe you've seen it online, me and this lady right here, we know what in the world our future held. We still don't know 100% but we know who holds our future. How in the world do you go from thinking you might be dying? I made out plans. I stuck a note underneath my keyboard. It's crazy to think about now. In case something happens to me, baby, this is my last will and testament right here. Call my cousin up. I said, look, this is where it's at. 
if you need. I don't want to tell my wife this is where it's at because I don't know what was happening. Doctor talking about having to go in my brain and pull out a tumor and leave a big hole there and this can happen and that can happen and the other can happen. I start reading up about how these aortic things, they can, it, just, just like that. You could be living one minute, looking around the room, smiling at everybody and all of a sudden, boom, just like that, drop dead. Because that aorta explodes. That's a main artery. I'm talking like an artery like sometimes be that big around. But whenever that artery is swole way up, it don't take very much. It could just explode. Boy, I was on pins and needles. I didn't even want her to walk across the room. I was afraid she sneezed, something might happen. We were already ready to die. And yet, yet they turn around and just like what, a year or two later? We got a nice little house. I told y'all we got one of them rich people's sprinkler systems. You know what I'm saying? I walked me watering the grass every night. And uh, God's blessed us. I just got through building me like a 48 foot long by 12 foot little pavilion on the side of the house. You know what I mean? We ain't got, we're not filthy rich. Not, not unless you ask my daughter-in-law. She thinks that we're like wealthy or something. I don't know. She act like that. I don't know. She thinks that. But here's what I'm showing you. Now, if you'd asked me two years ago, oh, God, I was dying. Now, how in the world did you get through that season? Because even though if I was hanging on by a little bitty thread, there were people that were praying for me. I was praying for myself. I had people that were supporting me. I, some of y'all was crying because, well, we don't know what in the world's happening. Our pastor, look, he's a little pathetic. I went down from like 245 pounds down to 209 pounds. Y'all saw me walking in here, and I had my belt on. Now I can barely fit in these britches. Y'all know what I'm saying? Y'all know why my wardrobe looked crazy up on Friday nights? Because I can't fit in some of it. But some of my pants that were so small, if I put them on, they would fall right back off. My, my wife said, babe, we're going to have to get you some more suits because the, the, the pants on the side would be wadded all up while I tried to put the belt so tight and I had a big old bunched up 209 pounds. That's what I got down to. Why? Stress, trouble, anxiety. Boy, how in the world you make it? All I can tell you is that during my Zarephath season, during my Brook Cherith season, I served a God that said, buddy, hang on. I got you. I'm telling you, it wasn't easy. There were times I thought I was going out, but God kept me through it. And if God can do it, then guess what? God can do it tonight. Will you stand to your feet across the Lord's house? Come on up here, Sister Miranda. Get ready to sing the house down. Amen. Boy, I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. And I just want you to understand that things may have been rough. Things might get rougher than they are. But I know a God who can take care of you. We all fight our little battles, don't we, Brother Fred? I still remember just a couple of weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, standing right there how you testified. And you said, I want y'all to pray for me. He said, I don't know what's going on, but sometimes I turn my head a certain way and Pass out. And here lately, I've been passing out a whole lot more. I got to go for tests. I got to go for exams. They got to check me out. I've pastored this church during this process you've been going through, in and out, in and out of the hospital. Some of them folk at the hospital and around them clinics, they probably know y'all by first name. Cancer treatments and not knowing what the future may hold, but just holding on to the hem of his garment. What I'm telling you is, is that it might be a hard process and you might go back to that meal barrel and there don't seem like much in there. Go ahead, get your scoop, scoop it out and run another day. Because I believe that, if, that in your obedience to keep serving the Lord in spite of your circumstances, first of all, you'll have family that are going to be watching your life. And when you are gone, they will always remember how mama stood by daddy's side, went with him to the appointments, bore the load of the diagnosis, but kept on being faithful to God. They'll always remember that. Number one, you're leaving a legacy. And number two, you're letting God know, my love for you, God, my worship is bigger than a church service where we stand up and raise our hands. My love for you is a whole lot bigger than pulling up at the parking lot at Grace Street Church. 
my love for you is bigger than all of that. 